Hello, SOS 212 class. My name is Giselle, and I took this course back in spring 2020. During this course, I was particularly interested in system archetypes and how they translate and can be applied into real world scenarios. So in this video, I will be explaining the escalation system archetype, building a simple causal loop diagram of the escalation archetype using a realistic scenario, and then transforming that CLD into a stock and flow diagram. Towards the end of the video, I'll be then analyzing the results produced by the graphs to look at escalation dynamics within the system. So according to Kim and Lennon in 1997, the escalation archetype examines the dynamics of two or more players as they manage their own balancing loop in response to the threatening actions of others. So essentially it's just a constant cycle of threat and response between two parties until the system gets out of control over time and escalates. Now the escalation archetype suggests that cutthroat competition serves no one well in the long run. And when I first read this competition, I agreed that competition was the first thing that came to mind and more specifically competition within markets. So Apple and Microsoft, for example, are top companies that pose a threat to one another due to competition for customers. So I thought it'd be really interesting to look at how the relationship between these two companies is affected using um, a model through the lens of the escalation system archetype. So this is the CLD model for the escalation archetype. And from this model, you can see that the results of party B causes a threat to party A, which then leads to some sort of activity done by party A, which then results in the results of party A and vice versa. So I know that sounds kind of complicated. So for our purposes, let's go ahead and switch out party A for Apple and party B for Microsoft. So as you can see, an increase in Microsoft users leads to an increase in new Apple products and services because Apple is trying to compete with Microsoft for those um, customers, essentially. So when they, when they increase their amount of products and services, this leads to an increase in their sales. And we can see on the right side of this diagram that an increase in Apple users leads to an increase and new Microsoft products and services because again, Microsoft is competing with Apple, which then leads to an increase in sales. And it's just this constant process that kind of reflects like an infinity sign because it's like this infinite process that just gets out of control. So now that we have our CLD created, how can we convert this CLD into a more sophisticated stock and flow model? So every model is unique and there's different parameters and variables that affect the outcome of our model that we need to consider. So for this scenario, we should at least think about market saturation and product dynamics. For less experienced modelers, it's always best to start off with a simple model that doesn't have those market saturation or product dynamics. And then you can eventually build on that model by adding the product dynamics and market saturation. And then once those variables are in place, you can just go ahead and input realistic values to make the model as accurate to reality as possible. And this is something that you'll be doing in your final projects as well. So hopefully this whole modeling process will be of use to some of you. All right, so let's go ahead and switch on over to Benson so I can show you guys the model that I made based off of the CLD diagram. So here's my model and it obviously looks a little bit different from the CLD we had before, but essentially it's the same. I'd mentioned product dynamics and market saturation before switching on over to Bensum. And market saturation is represented in this model by the fixed number of consumers that move back and forth between the Microsoft user and Apple user stocks um, using a certain amount of products between the different companies. So furthermore, the product dynamics include the new product flows into the products and the average cost of products factoring into the development costs. You might have noticed that some of that there were some additional variables and then I even changed the names of some of the variables. So the new variables that were added were the average price and new products. I also decided to switch sales out for development costs. Um, just the title of that variable because it didn't make sense to show that sales were increasing continuously when the number of consumers in the market is fixed. Instead, I wanted to show that development effort is continuously growing and that when there are more Microsoft users and there will be more Apple development costs associated with that and which leads to the recruitment of 
more, I guess, Apple users due to new products that are released. And so if we could direct our attention towards the bottom of the model, here we have the stocks of Microsoft and Apple users, and we have the flows that are going back and forth between the two stocks that represent the customers fluctuating between the two companies as the companies compete for new users. So for the new user Apple formula flow, um, I have the input set at Microsoft users multiplied by Apple development costs relative to Microsoft development costs. And then for the new Microsoft user flow, I have Apple users multiplied by one minus the Apple development cost relative to Microsoft development costs. And the reason why I have the one minus in the Microsoft user flow is because I wanted to reflect the negative link between uh, Apple development costs relative to Microsoft development costs and the new Microsoft user flow. If we now move from users to new products. The positive link is represented through the formula users divided by products. Now, whenever there's an increase in new Apple products, for example, there is a new Microsoft user, but as Apple products grow, the amount of per user decreases and this applies to Microsoft as well. The positive link from Apple products to Apple development costs is represented through multiplying Apple products by the average price per product. And then for the Apple products, that formula just consisted of multiplying new Apple products by Apple products to get that positive relationship between those variables. And so as we look at the Apple development cost relative to the Microsoft development cost variable, we can see that the negative, the negative uh, causal link from Microsoft development costs is reflected in the formula because we have Apple development costs divided by Apple development costs in addition to the Microsoft development costs. So we have that positive link from Apple development costs and that negative link from Microsoft going into that variable and then we can see some of those dynamics within the system. So now that we've gone through the model, let's see if we can take a look at some of the escalation dynamics within the system. So let me go ahead and scroll down real quick. And here are some graphs that I've generated just for us to take a look at. So the first graph on the left compares Apple users with Microsoft users. And we can see that there's a stable balance between the two stocks and that there's no fluctuations or anything. And then the graph to the right of it, which depicts Apple sales relative to Microsoft sales, also shows a balance within the system during the 50 year time frame that we're looking at. The next set of graphs that follows look at Apple versus Microsoft products and Apple versus Microsoft development costs. Here we can see that the two lines on both graphs are adjacent to one another and are linear. The red line represents Apple, which you can see is a little bit higher than the blue, which represents Microsoft. And we can see escalation behaviors taking place between these two graphs because the lines are continuously increasing over time in response to threatening actions taking place by each company, which eventually just serves no one well in the long run. Although in theory, both companies are head to head and they're equally competitive with one another, I did purposely input figures and formulas into my model for Apple that would give them a slight edge in the scenario by making some of their inputs higher than Microsoft to increase their total output. So I didn't do that for all the Apple variables, but for example, the initial value for Apple products was 15 in comparison to Microsoft, which was 10. And then I also made the average price for Apple products at 200 while Microsoft was just 150. So our initial conditions did change the final outcome of our graphs, but I wanted to like reflect the competition aspect of, you know, real world markets accurately within the system. So I kind of just um, slightly altered those figures a little bit. So to make some final concluding remarks, the point of escalation dynamics is that a quantity that is attempting to be changed by both parties remains stable because of the counteracting actions of both parties. So as a consequence, other variables such as the Apple and Microsoft products and their development cost grows unbounded, which are reflected in the graphs that we see here. 
So even though the two companies are trying to get ahead of each other, they're actually just locked in this continue, continuous process of competition and just, you know, putting out new products out there, which makes more products available to consumers. But this also means that Apple and Microsoft are just constantly putting in a lot of effort to release products into markets in order to keep that ratio, the Apple to Microsoft development cost ratio the same. So I think it's also important to know that, the, that systems are just very complicated in general and that there's a lot of different factors that influence variables. So keeping that in mind, this is just a simple model that doesn't account for all complex var variables that affect market outcome. Um, adding in additional variables would likely change the time scale of the escalation dynamics that are taking place within the models. This model really is just meant to be an illustrative model to provide more detailed dynamics than a simple CLD would, but still providing that insight that we wouldn't be able to get from a normal CLD. Um, so that was pretty much it, you guys. It was really fun creating this model and seeing how system archetypes can relate to real world scenarios and how we can see their behaviors within certain systems. So this was a really interesting example to take a look at. And I hope you were able to learn something from this video. This is a really fun class and I definitely recommend taking something you're interested in and applying it to system dynamics. So with that, good luck with the class everyone and thanks for watching.